Langtang National Park is one of Nepal's most inviting tourist attractions. With breathtaking mountain views and clear, glassy lakes, the park spans 660 square miles and is home to some of the country's most spectacular wildlife, including snow leopards and red pandas. While the park attracts up to 18,000 visitors a year, it is no stranger to losing some of those travelers. Aubrey Sarko is one of those who vanished within its boundaries, never to be seen again. Twenty-three-year-old Aubrey Sarko was raised in Greeley, Colorado, and was a student at the University of Colorado in Boulder at the time of her disappearance. Known to be generous and smiley, her friends named her Aubrey Glitter because she often carried a bottle of the sparkly stuff. Similarly, her parents said her motto was Glitter the World. She was described as a woman who wanted to live life to the fullest, and she enjoyed art, music, yoga, and organizing campus events. When she attended university, her colorful personality shone even more. She frequently attended raves and became the life of the party. But according to her sister-in-law, Amanda, Aubrey changed when she took a life-changing trip to Asia toward the end of her school career. The party-goer was gone. Amanda recalled, she didn't need all of that to feel energized and happy. Aubrey's parents last saw the 23-year-old when she was dropped off at Denver International Airport on December 13th, 2009, where she planned to partake in a solo sightseeing trip around Asia. Wanting to broaden her horizons, Aubrey made stops in Sri Lanka, where she'd been searching for octopus in the Indian Ocean before moving on to Mysore, India volunteering at an orphanage and studying yoga. She then spent some time in Darjeeling. Here, on the rooftop of her hostel, Aubrey took in the sight of the Himalayan mountains and decided that Nepal would be her next stop. She spent two days traveling to Kathmandu, rented gear for the trip, and took a seven-hour bus journey to the beginning of the trail. She last communicated with her parents on April 20th, 2010, when she arrived in the country and told them she would be finishing her hike on the 30th. Reportedly, Aubrey's parents attempted to dissuade the young woman from going on the potentially dangerous hike alone, especially since her father, Paul, was due to undergo hip surgery at this time. They wanted her to at least wait until he was out of surgery, but Aubrey told her parents it would be fine, stating, don't worry, it's a national park, it's tea house trekking, it's safe. She started her trip the next day, on April 21st. Aubrey began her walk down a two-track road, eventually winding up at a checkpost staffed by a military policewoman. Staff members recalled her wide grin and how enthusiastic and friendly she seemed as she signed the hiker's register and walked through the checkpoint with a wave. She followed the trail north, passing dozens of other people, including villagers, tourists, and guides. She arrived at the Namaste Tea House, and while there, met Renzin Yonzan, a tour guide and university student who'd grown up in the Langtang Valley. According to locals, the pair quickly took a liking to one another and talked for hours. The following day, they said their goodbyes, with the promise to meet up again in Kathmandu in two weeks. They parted ways, with Aubrey continuing her journey up the valley while Renzin headed down. Aubrey carried on with her trek up the valley, still passing tourists and local families. Several witnesses saw her successfully climb a steep hillside, which could be challenging to some, as one wrong move could cause a slip and fall into the rapids below. Further onlookers saw the 23-year-old stop at Lama Hotel, a small town consisting of numerous tea houses and a vegetable garden, where she had pizza and held the book Renzin had given to her when they'd met. In the Sherpa Lodge in the early afternoon, she spoke with three young men in their late teens and early twenties. While the conversation began friendly enough, it took a turn when Aubrey told them of her plans to reach Riverside and was told by the men that it was too far away for her to get there safely given the time of day. 
Aubrey, however, didn't take kindly to this warning. She spread her map out on the table and told them, Riverside is only an hour from here. Don't lie to me. Notably, the 23-year-old wasn't entirely wrong. A reasonably fit individual could walk to Riverside from Llama Hotel in maybe two hours, but Aubrey failed to sign the hiker's register in Riverside. There was no trace of her in the area, and it couldn't be proven that she'd even made it there. She also didn't walk further. At least, she didn't sign the register at the next checkpoint, Gora Tabula. A week passed before Aubrey's parents realized that something was wrong. After five months of near-constant contact with their daughter, her sudden radio silence alarmed them. Her mother, Connie, notified the US Embassy in Kathmandu, where officials told her that civil unrest may have delayed the 23-year-old on her return trip. But still, a further three days passed and there was no sign of Aubrey. On May 16th, six days before she would have flown home from Sri Lanka, her father Paul set out to find her, arriving in Kathmandu and swearing to bring his little girl home. Aubrey's older brother, Crofton, joined in the search. Individuals from the US Embassy, nearby villages, guide services, the police, and the army joined in the hunt for the missing 23-year-old. A translator aided the family as they questioned the locals. Between May 4th and July 1st, over 200 people searched the Langtang Valley by air, foot, and rope, making sure to check smaller paths and isolated monasteries in the hills. An American named Scott McLennan joined the search too. He often led trips in the area and had been doing so for a decade. Additionally, he was the executive director of a humanitarian organization, the Mountain Fund. He told Paul that he suspected Aubrey had become the victim of some of the young military men who acted as the park's rangers. Notably, they had a reputation for abusing women. He added, None of the girls who ever worked for me in my medical clinic would stay the night because it was next to an army post. Chillingly, this isn't the first time this kind of issue has been heard of in the area. In 2010, Three French women reported being sexually assaulted by the soldiers operating the Gora Tabula watch post, the one after Riverside. In 2011 and 2012, two more Western women were attacked in the same area in separate incidents. Furthermore, in 2005, a French national named Celine Henry and a German native named Sabine Grunkley disappeared five weeks apart. Investigators found blood, clothing, and pages from both of their passports in Nagarjun Forest, located in a separate national park on the northern fringe of Kathmandu Valley. Detectives told the local papers they believed a serial killer was operating in the area, raping women, killing them, and burying them but the perpetrator was never brought to justice. Over a year after Aubrey disappeared, in December of 2011, an American woman was assaulted while hiking in the Helambu region, but she managed to escape the assault and likely death by the skin of her teeth. Five months later, in May of 2012, a 23-year-old from Belgium, Debbie Mavo, was hiking in the same region when she vanished into thin air. She was found 10 days later having been decapitated. Other theories in Aubrey's case are much less sinister, however, with some locals suggesting that the 23-year-old fell into the water during her journey and was swept away by the currents. Some Tamang villagers believe they saw her board a helicopter in Langtang village, while others say it was the fault of hunters who went out at night, killing animals and people. A man in charge of a Pokhara-based rescue organization believed Aubrey's disappearance to be sacrificial, claiming that she'd been taken by witches worshipping Kali, the Hindu goddess of death. Some men blamed Aubrey herself, claiming she was too free and frank and was responsible for her own sexual assault and murder. Others suggested that she was sex trafficked, and a psychic in Tamang claimed that she'd been buried under a pile of rocks by three boys. On June 6th, Aubrey's father and brother left Langtang. Their search efforts were fruitless. Crofton flew home to Colorado, while Paul remained in Kathmandu, where he set up interviews and held meetings with the police and embassy officials. By the middle of June, he told his wife he would not be able to keep his vow. He would not be bringing their daughter home. Connie and Paul learned about Aubrey's final interactions at the Sherpa Lodge from a local kayaking guide named Ramesh, who questioned villagers in the weeks after the family's first search. 
The couple flew out to Nepal in January of 2011, hoping to follow up with this information, as nothing came of it via official channels. After journeying up the valley, they headed to the Sherpa Lodge, where they spoke with the owner, the cook, and one of the young men Aubrey had interacted with that afternoon. All three confirmed seeing the 23-year-old to Ramesh, but by this point, their stories had changed. They told Connie and Paul that they hadn't seen her on the day of her disappearance. The young man added, We don't remember seeing this girl, but if we had known she was going to go missing, we wouldn't have let her leave. Connie and Paul then attempted to question the cook again, but the lodge owner's wife screamed at him, Don't answer. The couple was understandably frustrated by the brick wall they'd hit. They didn't understand why someone would stop two parents from finding and bringing home their daughter. However, it's possible the villagers were afraid. In 2000, a British hiker was found dead in the Langtang River. The fishermen who'd reported finding his body were blamed for his death and imprisoned. The Sokos are aware that this is a strong possibility, telling the press, the FBI have told us that the villagers are not talking, and all of the searchers that have interviewed those people know that the villagers are withholding information. They're protecting each other because they're afraid of the police. The FBI became involved with the search in 2010, although their aid didn't bring the family answers. Between 2010 and 2012, police re-interviewed the individuals at Sherpa Lodge, along with Renzin Yonzen, and each soldier at the Gora Tabela checkpoint was interviewed several times over, even those who were not on duty at the time of Aubrey's disappearance. But despite all of this, there were no leads and no sign of the 23-year-old. The Sarkos aren't the only family to be met with frustration and walls of silence when searching for a loved one in a remote region. Rachel Crowther's brother, Julian Wine, vanished in the Everest region in 2008. The family searched for a year before conceding defeat, with Rachel stating, I do not see what else we can do. The whole Nepali government and system are corrupt. There is no one to investigate. It leaves our family feeling totally frustrated and helpless. Back in the US, the Sarkos hired a private investigator who was sent out twice to Nepal to carry out interviews, but they were ultimately unable to find answers in the case. They continued to apply pressure to law enforcement in Nepal, however, which resulted in further searches for Aubrey being carried out by the military several years after she vanished. One frustrated soldier in uniform told writer Tracy Ross, who wrote about Aubrey's case for Backpacker.com, Look, when that girl went missing, we did everything we could. We went in a helicopter. The army searched. If a Nepali went missing in America, would your army look? Locals, for the most part, seemed to be tired of answering questions by 2012, two years after Aubrey went missing. Some even stated that they no longer cared about her disappearance. A police officer named Sudeep Giri said, We are sad for their loss, but you must know this is a dangerous place. In the time she disappeared, it is rainy season. You can see big falls into the river. So that time you can see the accident is high in this area. We are still doing searching and have cultivated some agents. But since this case is a little bit very old, if you ask the people from the Lama area, they will say that's enough. This same officer, when confronted about the unsolved murder of Debbie Mavo, who was decapitated in 2012, stated that he didn't know what had happened to her, bizarrely adding, but her body, we found it two weeks after. It was a sloping area. Her head was down below her. And you know this is a national park and lots of wild animals. Maybe because of the gravity. Reportedly, crime scene photographs showed Debbie's left arm was missing and one of her shoes was gone. Her slaying is still unsolved. In December of 2011, Aubrey's parents attempted to identify a man in a photograph they found on her laptop and appealed to the public for help. They noted that the man was not a suspect, just somebody they wished to speak with as they didn't recognize him as one of Aubrey's friends or as someone the police had interviewed. The man is described as slim, blonde-haired, and white. In the photograph, he is wearing a blue polo shirt. The photo was taken in Darjeeling, India. He is still unidentified, and it's unknown if he had any sort of connection to Aubrey's disappearance. In April of 2013, exactly three years after Aubrey went missing, her parents returned to Nepal. 
speaking with witnesses, they found that several soldiers were in the vicinity of the Namaste Tea House on the day Aubrey left there to continue her journey up the valley. However, nothing further came of this lead, and the Sakos felt they were reaching a dead end. This led to their complete and utter disbelief when they were informed that Aubrey's killer had been caught just months later. On July 31st, 2013, they were told that three men had been arrested and that they'd confessed to the murder. Interestingly, Aubrey's parents had been made aware of a lead of a similar nature much earlier in the investigation. This lead had not been seen as credible at the time by investigators, and so it had been dismissed. The lead consisted of witnesses seeing three men attacking a woman near Namaste and throwing her body into the nearby river. According to the US Embassy, an undercover Nepali police officer had met with a man who told him he was responsible for Aubrey's disappearance. The pair became friends so that the officer could gather more information, and soon learned that two other men were involved with the murder. The media reported that one of the suspects had Aubrey's camera, while rumors swirled that her clothing was found in another suspect's home. One of the men was aged 22, the other a teenaged boy, aged 16. The Sarkos were naturally overwhelmed with grief, anger, frustration, and confusion. They experienced a cascade of varying emotions, only to be informed on August 1st that the Nepali police inspector had doubts about the man who'd claimed responsibility for the disappearance. Pressing him further, the man changed his story and named his co-conspirators as people who didn't exist. Furthermore, investigators had no physical evidence. The three suspects were subsequently let go after almost a month in police custody. In the years since, there has been no publicly known movement in the investigation, and it appears that Aubrey's case is at a standstill. 23-year-old Aubrey Sacco was last seen by her parents on December 13th, 2009, when they dropped her off at Denver International Airport in Colorado. She was last seen by witnesses in Nepal on April 22nd, 2010, in Langtang National Park. She is described as a white woman with brown hair and brown eyes. She is five foot two, and weighed 125 pounds when she was last seen. Her middle name is Caroline. If she is still alive, she will be 36 years old. If you have any information about her disappearance, you can contact the Greeley Police Department at 970-350-9605. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.